there's only one way to tell a story, and that's over a drink, paid for, preferably, by somebody else. And in a pub like this, that's not difficult. In the summer, the tourists. In the winter, the weekend people from our nearby towns. All of them wanting the same thing, to feel part of the countryside, to feel part of people like me. Anyway. I talk, and they listen. But what they're never sure about is whether what I'm telling them is the truth. I can see it in their eyes. I'm in the middle of a story, and there's this uncertainty, a sort of half-belief, a kind of wanting to believe but not being sure about it. But the joke is, my private joke, you'll understand, is that all of it, every single word of it, is gospel. The people who live here in the village don't doubt me at all. The older ones have known me from a boy. I was a bit of a character even then, they tell me. Hi, then. How are you, all right? Fine, thanks. Lovely day. Yeah, beautiful. Where are you going to do that? I'm not trying to get my tea. Mother's, oh, uh, you know. Oh, see you again, then. OK, and see you Hello. later. Bye. As for the young ones, well, they know about the poaching, or think they do. Sometimes I think they know more about me than I know myself. But tall tales always get taller in the telling, don't they? And I don't mind. They want a hero. Well, why not me? Better than some these days. So I never deny a thing. Nor admit it, neither. Hold the gun. I'll give you a cartridge to put in there. Yeah. Bring the gun together. Cock the gun. Now you're ready to fire. Yeah. Right. And I dress like a bit of a hero. A touch of the gypsy. And why not? An old army jacket. But that's not just for show. One inside pocket, big enough for a ferret. And another one, even bigger. Big enough and more for one of Lordy's ducks. Just waiting for me down there along the estuary. On one of those misty mornings when it's all still and reddish gray. And nobody else in the world seems alive, save me. My favourites are those lovely fish in Lordy's stream, up there beneath the trees. I'll tell you about tickling for sea trout. First, make sure no one's about, especially one of Lordy's keepers. You know, of all the talents in the countryside, tickling to me is the one. It's got something to do, I reckon, with the hunter being completely out of his element and the hunted completely at home in his. Just you try wading through a stream without causing a ripple. There's a gentleness about it, too, and a lovely sense of style and skill. Fish look lazy in a stream, nose to the flow of it. Just the flick of a tail, the merest twist to keep them just where they want to be. But don't you believe it? Sea trout and salmon? Wild animals? Survivors? Where have you come from, old friend? And out of all the estuaries and the rivers and the streams, what miracle brought you back to this one? The water in which you were born. 
My hand slides in to caress you. My touch is as soft as a maiden's kiss. No escape this time, old friend. Fingers in the gills. And then, the explosion. Mind you, nobody, not even me, can make a living out of poaching. So I do other things as well. Nothing nine to five, that's for other people. Just things I enjoy. And then, only when I feel like it. I spend a fair amount of time down by the water, under this great soaring railway bridge that Brunel built. You know, there used to be a chap who lived here who could throw a stone right over it. Extraordinary. I've got this old shed down by the estuary. Only taken to locking it up in the last year or so, come to think of it. That's a sign of the times. But anyway, like I was saying, this is where you can often find me. Fixing up a boat, carving a bit of wood, painting an inn sign, mending a bit of rigging. Things I've taught myself. Things I like. Things people will pay me for. evening home this is my place better now than it was I've done a fair amount of work on it but it was the setting I always liked anyhow the trees and the stream and I'll tell you a funny thing I'd known this place ever since I was a boy but I'd never been inside it and when they said I could have it I stood outside and I knew exactly what it would be like inside and especially this fireplace. I opened the door, and there it was. Stone for stone. Strange, wasn't it? But you know, I've learned that lesson from the countryside. You can never be sure that things are just what they seem to be. I've seen magic done. Don't laugh. Magic with the most common of hedge plants. Even with a twig like this, half strangled with honeysuckle. Such twigs have magic powers, but only if you cut it in the right way. White magic, black magic, coincidence, suggestion, call it what you will, but I've seen it work. Village people will often come to me to charm away their warts, and it nearly always works. It's simple, if you know how. I'm gonna draw this here circle, all right? A magic circle drawn in the grass with a hazel stick. Now then, I want you to step into this circle through that gap there. So come on in here now. Come right in. Right. Now, you want to get rid of this wart. Yeah. Right then, what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut this potato, I'm going to rub it on there. Then, take a common or garden potato, cut him in half, and rub it on the wart. Right, where's that wart? Right on me, buddy. Right. There's one, and there's two. Pure wool wrapped round the potato, and the whole thing buried in a secret place at midnight. The great thing is to never tell a living soul where. Right then, boy. Now, what I want you to do, take that potato home, bury it in your garden at 12 o'clock tonight, mine, all right? Yeah. And then forget all about your work. Go on then, off you go home then. Half my life, and more, I dare say, in the daylight and the dark, has been spent along the hedgerows and in the woods. 
by the rivers and the streams, the salt flats and the coppices. Show me a hedge, and I'll show you where a thrush will build. Show me a copse, and I'll show you where a pheasant will roost. I was reading in the paper the other day about some fellow up north who was calling himself the king of the poachers. King? He wouldn't even be a prince. He had a list of convictions as long as your arm. A poacher, a real poacher, I mean, should go through his life from his cradle to the grave without even having the finger of suspicion pointing at him. I can't say that, but I've never been in court. One Christmas, I gave Lordy himself a brace of pheasants, and all he said was, to each his own. And I'll tell you something else. Never in the whole of my life have I ever killed just for the sake of killing. I think about that a lot when I'm in the woods. 250 pheasants a day. That's not sport. That's murder. Slaughtering things that you can't recreate. Not for me. One evening, just after dusk it was, and don't you believe anything they tell you about a poacher's moon? A fallacy, that is. Moons are for keepers, not poachers. Well, one evening just after dusk, I was in the woods, and I looked up, and right there in front of me was this fox, no more than ten yards away. A beauty. And we stood there, just like that. He looking at me, and me looking at him. I brought up the gun, and there he was, straight down the barrels. And I said to myself, well, well, old friend, we're after the same thing, aren't we? A nice, plump duck. But if I don't get one, there'll be some bread and cheese. But what will there be for you? I lowered the gun. He kept looking at me for, well, it must have been 10 seconds or more. And then he turned away. He didn't run, just a sort of loping walk. Things like that have happened to me more than once. It's as if you build up a sort of understanding, a sympathy almost, frightening in a way. Killer and victim, all the power one-sided. The victim almost knowing, resigned, willing you to pull the trigger. There's nothing tastier than a pheasant that you've caught yourself, and I should know. I've had a few. Looking lovely, will be. Poachers are born, they say, not made. Once a man said to me, if there was one pheasant in a four-acre wood, you could walk straight to him. And he was right, you know. Oh. I could. But you love him, wouldn't he? except for one time. For a whole week, nothing went right for me. Not a pheasant, and I've never had trouble with them. In fact, there are so many ways of taking pheasants that I'm surprised there are any of them left. Not a fish, not a duck, not even a rabbit in a snare, and they're easy enough. But for this whole week, nothing. Even my favorite ferret failed. And it wasn't as if anything had changed. Same woods, same tracks. I know the place like the back of my hand. Every tree, every bush, every twig almost. And I did all the same things. But for a whole week, nothing. I said to myself, nothing's changed with you, old son. You're doing it like you've always done it. So what the hell's going wrong? And it was then that I saw the fire. Not a big one, one flame, orange in the dark. I moved towards it. And quite suddenly, it went out. You, you know how it is. You think you've seen something, and suddenly, 
It isn't there anymore. But I'd seen that fire. I was sure of it. And I crept to where it had been, to a clearing in the Elders. There was a circle there, scraped in the mud. I was wary of crossing it, knowing about these things. And as I did, I felt a distinct chill come over me. There were the ashes. I reached down and touched them. They were cold, stone cold. And so was I. The next night, the same thing. All the snares empty. And I'd set them, I swear to you, with all the care of an apprentice. Me, an apprentice. But that's what I'd done. I don't like saying this, but the fact of the matter was that I'd begun to doubt myself. I went back over all the things I'd learnt and taught myself, and I did them, for the first time in years, by the book. Still, nothing. Nothing, that is, except the fire. And then, as I made the move towards it, it disappeared. For nights after that, the same thing happened. A different place, but always the same fire. And the woods were different, too. There's always sound in a nighttime wood. You know, a stir of branches, the snapping of a twig. But the strange thing was, and I'm not sure I was really aware of it at the time, but every time I saw those fires, there was bird song in the air. And birds don't sing at night, do they? Each time I saw the fire, I'd move towards it. 200 yards, 100, 25. But any closer, and the fire would go out. Then, on the seventh night, I went into the woods again, making this time towards the stream where I'd tickled the salmon and trout. There was a sliver of a moon, I remember, and a stillness that was uncanny. I looked up, and there was the fire. I had to cross the stream, so I took off my boots and hung them round my neck. No sound, just a swirl of water and the eerie bird song. Once across the stream, I was quite near the fire. I could see it distinctly. The dancing flames, the swirling smoke, closer than I'd ever been.
And then, quite suddenly, the man appeared, moving into the firelight. He looked to where I was, and he beckoned. I think I was frightened. I'm not quite sure now, but I know what I really was. I was bloody annoyed that a poacher, as good as I reckon I am, well, it's the worst thing that can happen to a poacher, that he can be seen by anybody when he's been using every trick he's ever learned not to be seen. But nothing for it, I thought. He didn't look like a keeper. So I got up and walked towards the fire. Around it, as before, was the circle, scraped in the earth. I stopped at the edge of it. The man looked at me across it. That's not for you, he said, and told me to join him. It's a fine night. It is a fine fire. I've been waiting for you. Waiting for me? What do you want with me? Shall I help you? We sat together talking by the fire. For how long? I'm still not sure. An hour, maybe. Perhaps two. The fire blazed on. It worried me. It could be seen for miles, I was sure. And Lordy's keepers, I knew from experience, were likely to be much closer than that. The man seemed to read my mind. There's only two people in this world that can see that fire, he said. And that's you and me. And it was then that I began to think that this was no place for me to be. What's your name, then? Look down. Look down? Why? I dragged my eyes from his face and looked down. And where his feet should have been, there were two cloven hooves. Slowly, he stood up and then came towards me. I was terrified, but I couldn't move. It was as if I'd been struck by lightning. The whole of his shoulder seemed to burn. A hot iron couldn't have been worse. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but when I came to, he'd gone. And that's when I ran. Uncaring of noise, uncaring of anything. Keepers to hell with keepers. Across the stream, in and out of the rhododendrons, dodging the dark trunks of the dark trees, blundering, blundering, blundering. A professional poacher. Oh, not me. Not then. From that day on, everything seemed to go right with me. It was as if I was one of the chosen ones, one of the favored. Nice one. That's a booty. Will do. A whole fortnight it had been, and I'd taken nothing. But now, nothing got away. I couldn't fail, and all the old tricks began to work again. 
In time, the burning sensation left my shoulder, but the mark didn't. It turned from red to black. And I know you're not going to believe this. It took on the shape of a cloven hoof. I hid it from everybody. Never ever did anybody, even on the hottest of hot summer days, nobody saw me without a shirt on. But in the woods, I was infallible. It was at that precise moment that I stopped being a poacher. It was all too easy. The sense of adventure had gone. It was like being a burglar in a town with no locks. It was as if a special power had been conferred upon me. And if it had, well, I knew where it had come from. And I wanted no more of it. From then on, I walked the countryside like a landlord, like Lordy himself. I looked at it, and I loved it, but I took nothing from it, except for what's always there, the beauty for those who have eyes that want to see. Of course, it was harder for the dog than me. He wanted to be up and doing, all this sitting about under trees and looking. I don't think he ever understood. Last spring in the pub, I told this story, just as I've told it to you. And I looked at the eyes, and in them, I saw what I knew would be there. Disbelief in some, a sort of grudging half-belief in others. Except for one man. And in his eyes, I saw something else. Not belief, nor disbelief. Just the look of somebody who's used to be in the center of attention and for the past half hour or so hadn't been. As you know, I carry his mark to this day. <laughs> oh, I knew what he was going to do. After all, there was only one proof of my story. And I thought, to hell with it. And I said to myself, don't you bother, old son. I'll do it for you. You want to see? So, see.